Welcome to Bits About Books, the home for conversations with authors of breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. Founders, entrepreneurs and individual professionals, we all need to keep track of ideas that are helping create our today and tomorrow. Bits About Books will strive to find those books and speak to their authors, go behind the scenes and understand what inspired the authors to write the books that they did and how they went about doing so. Through our conversations, we hope to gain insights that will help us to get the most out of our efforts. I'm your host Shubhanjan Sarkar, founder of Pitchlink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy. Welcome to Bits About Books. Thank you for your time and for joining us in this session. I have a favor to ask. While you continue to listen to the podcast, please leave a comment or rating at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts from. I personally look at each comment and will give you a shout out to each of you in our following episodes. It means a lot to hear from you. Our guest today is Peter Cohen and we speak with him about the third and latest edition of his bestseller, Great Demo, how to create and execute stunning software demonstrations. And the traditional qualification process to get a demo often includes things like BANT or similar uh, qualification methodologies, which basically rule those just browsing prospects out. And that, that's a win in their minds because they're, ah, we've not, uh, we're not going to waste any sales or pre-sales time doing an overview demo because this person's not in an active buying process. But here's the horror of lead churn. This person says, oh, great. I wanted to get a demo. I got nothing. <laughs> I got qualified out. So that person, when they do enter an active buying process, what's the likelihood that they would come back to that vendor? Very low. They'll go to someone else. Peter Cohen, the founder of The Second Derivative and The Great Demo and Doing Discovery Methodologies, helps software organizations achieve their pre-sales, sales and marketing objectives by making their discovery conversations competitively outstanding and their demos crisp, compelling and surprisingly effective. He has enjoyed roles in technical and product marketing, marketing management, sales, sales management, and senior management. In 2003, he authored Great Demo. The second edition of the book was published in 2005. In 2022, he published Doing Discovery. In his most recent role prior to the second derivative, Peter founded a business unit in an organization and grew the business from an empty spreadsheet into a 30 million operation. Peter has experience as an individual contributor, manager, and C-level team member in marketing, sales, and business development. He has also been and continues to be a prospect and a customer. Now, on to this actionable session with Peter Cohen. Peter, welcome to Bits About Books. I'm really delighted. It's I think this is the first time we are talking about a new edition of a book we spoke about many months back. Oh, that's terrific. I'm glad to do this. Yeah. And and it's also because your second edition you mentioned was 2005. We are in, that's nearly 20 years back. I'm sure it's about two decades since you identified this problem and you're talking about it and you still know how much of it still needs to change. So <laughs> there is a there is a discussion right there. Absolutely. But to start with, what made you think that it needs an update today? (laughs) Um, That's an easy answer. Many, many people pointed out that the second edition of the book, which was published in 2005, has references to technology that is no longer in use. So, For example, I think I was talking about modems. I may have been talking about fax machines and so forth. So Technologically, it needed to be updated, but much more importantly, um, things have changed rather dramatically since 2005. Uh, Methodology has been hardened in production use, it's been extended, it has evolved, and it really was time to draft this book for, if you will, the next 15 to 20 years of practitioners, or redraft the book for the next 20 years of practitioners. Yeah, and going forward, I would I do have some questions related to how you see the SaaS companies, which are like really numerous today, uh, how they can benefit from the great demo methodology. So, but but we'll com- come to that. So, when when you decided that it's time to do this, 
what was the process of actually, I mean, apart from taking out references to technologies which are not relevant or not available anymore, uh, what else did you have to do to sort of prep it for the third edition? So there's probably, um, I would say there are three dimensions here to explore. And this is, this is kind of fun. The first and very simple one has to do with um, who's, who and how the book will be consumed. So today, for example, there are three modes of consumption. There's paperback, which I'm holding up right now. Uh, there's Kindle, which you know people consume from an iPad or similar device. And then there's audiobook. So one of the first things was a recognition that when you present material in book form, you've got those three different audiences consuming through three different potentially vehicles. Uh, so for example, if instead of saying, dear reader, you have to say something like, uh, dear reader and listener, or simply those of you who are consuming this book, for example. So there's, there's if you will, those yeah. kinds of pragmatics. Um, and along those lines, uh, it's an interesting observation that when you draft a book that you know will become an audio book, you have to think carefully about bulleted lists. Uh, particularly long bulleted lists, <laughs> yeah. because if you want your producer to read them item by item, it can get kind of boring. Um, in any use of graphics, uh, graphs, tables, pictures, whatever, you have to think in terms of, well, how would somebody describe this? So that's yeah. a that's an angle that I think I, I didn't appreciate until a year ago when I finished drafting, um, doing discovery, but I was able to apply to this. So that's that's dimension number one. Uh, dimension number two, well, let me just pause there and ask any, any thoughts on that. I think that these are audio books need to have, um, especially because they're consumed mostly on smartphones, they should have the ability to actually show you the, the graphics. Well, that's, that's, you know, I don't think they've yet, let's put it this way. Amazon has yet, has not yet incorporated that capability. And I think they'll probably be unlikely to do so given how many people consume these books while they are, for example, driving. <laughs> absolutely. Or running. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Or running or whatsoever. I, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, so, I mean, it's also, I mean, for, for me, I have seen that if I'm going back to audiobook, I, I read a book and I am now listening to the audio because I want to go through it again. And I, I'm not reading the book. And some of the times I know about the graphics that is being described. But my ask was that if I was actually having the ability to go back to the graphics right there on this on my screen, it would have been very useful. But as you said, I mean, the, the use case of when people are listening to it makes it practically impossible to actually refer and and, and use it the way I was I was suggesting. Yeah. So for example, if you if you um if you include a four uh, quadrant graph, uh, that's actually fairly easy for a, a producer. Yeah. That's the person that would read the book since I couldn't read it myself because I cracked myself up. Um, a four quadrant grid can be pretty readily explained. So in the top left quad, quad we have X, Y, Z, et cetera. Where it gets difficult is where you have complex drawings where there's interrelationships. So, you know, imagine trying to verbally communicate a complicated flow chart that could be, you know, grasped visually. So your point about, you know, maybe Amazon and whoever should enable the production of audiobooks where there's an alternative to actually show the visuals as well. What, what I note are two sets of things. Number one, about one-sixth of the people that consume at least my book so far are, are purchasing them in audiobook format. So it's a pretty okay. good-sized population. Uh, and, and this is sort of surprising to me, many people buy two or more formats. So... Right. This maps to something that um, actually moves to the, the third dimension that I wanted to, to explain. Um, when you read a book, apparently, this is a study that was done years ago, at best, and I, I don't mean a fiction book, a novel, but I mean, a, for example, a business book, we remember at best about 10% of what we read. That's it, 10%, the rest is gone. And, you know, You'd read a ton of books. You could pro probably resonates with you if you go back and you think, okay, what do I remember from book X? You think, ah, not a lot. So what do people do? When they read books that they really want to remember, they, they underline, they highlight, yeah. they dog ear pages, they put post-it notes on. And these are mechanisms to you know, increase the retention of the content another 10 or 20%. 
When I drafted this version of Great Demo, um, I drafted it including, um, well, I call them axioms, which are just basically key principles in a few words, uh, stories and exercises. And the stories and exercises are not simply there to, to add some spice, but they're actually causatively placed. The stories are placed to enable people to try to get into the brains, if you will, of their prospects and other vendors to see how the methodology is actually applied um, and to build up the scenarios where the, you know, the methodology is, makes sense or provides rescues or solutions. The exercises are causatively in there um, with the intent of people actually doing them. And the same study that talked about uh, that only 10% of what you read is retained. Practice by doing, on the other hand, any any guess as to what percent is retained when you actually put the ideas into practice? Yeah, so I would, I would say that if it is done over a period of time, in fact, I just add to that 10% thing that that 10% you will also forget uh, based on what's your what's the hook on which it is hanging. In the sense, what is your residue? What's your retained knowledge of the past on which these new thoughts are hanging? If you are reading something completely new, you are likely to forget even even ninety five percent within six weeks of studying. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, forgetting curve. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we you need uh, you need uh, repetition uh, of of reading. So, for so so coming back to your question, uh, I, I would I would presume it would be like. 25%. Uh, it's actually 75%. Okay. So when people when people actually put the ideas into practice, when they when they, you know, if they if they follow the exercises of the book, they have mm -hmm. a dramatically higher probability of retaining and actually practicing these these ideas going forward. Um, so that so the book was drafted with that dimension in mind that okay, I don't, you know, people will read it and skim it and they'll say, yeah, I read the book. And my intent is that, that, okay, that's good, but what would really be great is if when you finish sections of the book, you, you've you actually put these ideas into practice and, and you're doing them. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. then my journey <laughs> for these folks who are consuming the book has been successful. So that's that's a critical difference. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as, you're, as, as you're saying this, and I'm, I'm thinking, did it sort of cross your mind that this the exercise portion could be parceled out into some kind of a digital workbook, which people could potentially uh, download from, from the website that you have. Um, I did, but again, I wanted to make this uh, as whole unto itself as possible. Um, sure. One of the fastest way to age a book is to put a link in it <laughs> to something that that disappears in six months from after the book is published. Then you know yeah. it's you know it's already dated itself, and so there was a yeah. lot of thought about future proofing the book too. Um, okay. So I'm you know I'm acknowledging the fact in the book I talk about how you know this technology that I'm referring to now probably won't exist five years from now. You know it'll be something completely whiz banging and exciting, but the core idea still needs applied to that. That's that's actually what has really resonated over the 20 years that this method, methodology has really been practiced. Does that, does right. that, uh, does that all resonate? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in fact, I, I, before we dive into the book, I, I also wanted you to talk a little bit about the great demo practice that you have, which is which is your, your whole teaching and, and, your, and, and you have a lot of trained trainers who actually do it all over the world. I, I would uh, I would like you to talk a bit about that so people get the context of where the book is coming from. Yeah, the book is the book is really <laughs> the book is in a funny way a method of enabling uh, people to be marketed to and pay for it. I mean that's that's a that's sort of a, a broad and bold statement, but the book is a lead-in for real training, and we uh, it is a worldwide organization, GreatDemo.com. Uh, there's a handful of partners in the U.S., in Europe, and in Asia Pacific, uh, and we've trained many thousands of people around the world uh, in the methodology. So the book is really designed to enable some people to do this on their own uh, and to support, in a much larger way, uh, this kind of training, the, the, if you will, adoption and implementation of a successful methodology across an organization. 
So for, for you know, teams that are looking to really see organizational change, that's really what our training programs are all about. So these are workshops that are typically a day to two days in length, um, focusing on doing discovery, on great demo methodology and related areas. Um, and the idea there is individuals can consume the book and, you know, on their own patient pace and for better and worse, make change themselves. Uh, the workshops and training is really designed to enable teams and organizations to uh, to um, manage those transformations. So thank you for that. In fact, that's that's another interesting thing that I noticed, and and I wanted you to also touch upon that before we again start talking about the book. Is that you your your second book, which is doing discovery, has a lot of integrated, uh, should I say, thoughts in this in this edition of Great Demo, right? So, so I, I can see that they, they're being sort of channelized together, so to say. Uh, uh, w- what sort of made you do that? Uh, and and how did you think about that part of, of the book when you were thinking of this edition? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce this in the form of sort of a, a sad story. <laughs> I, when I... When I, gra- I drafted Great Demo, um, the first and second editions, and started teaching workshops, this is now back starting in 2003, so it's now, in fact, just a little bit over 20 years of doing this. Um, I was working on the, under the assumption, um, because of my background, that sales and pre-sales teams did a at least adequate, if not excellent, job of doing discovery. And what I discovered as I began to get into workshops is that I was wrong. <laughs> By and large, um, software sales teams do, do a pretty poor job of doing discovery. Um, and it took me until about 2015 before I realized that, that this was really the case. It was endemic. It was all across the industry. And I began to incorporate um portions of doing discovery into great demo workshops, but realize that, well, there's no manual for this. There's no guidebook. There's nothing for people to draw upon or, or, or help them. And so I, I looked at, began to look at drafting the doing discovery around 2016. And then finally, uh, through a series of events, <laughs> finally got it done uh, a year ago, or just, just under a year ago. Um, books are written to be companion pieces. They're, des- they're designed to reinforce one another. Right. Um, and so, you know, great demo was drafted because demos were so awful <laughs> and still are in many cases as a, as a recipe for success. Doing discovery was drafted as the, initially as a companion piece to fill a huge gap where organizations were not going to be able to do a great demo because they had done insufficient discovery. So these two books now are, are were drafted with the mind's eye towards them actually working together. And that's partly why Doing Discovery has call-outs to Great Demo, and Great Demo has call-outs to Doing Discovery. They, they really are designed to be a matched pair. Yeah, and they are. I mean, I mean, there's no two ways about it. And I think you cannot really separate them out because a lot of the times, finally, the time you get from the customer is limited, and you need to process it optimally to, to do both, right? So doing the discovery and showing them what will make them think forward uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and give them the value that the, that their time demands, right? Uh, yeah. The last question before we get into the book is how, how do you see the ideas in, in the book uh, when they're applied to the current huge explosion in the SaaS uh, industry. So it's different from the earlier days when you had a very expensive software being sold to a company. Most of the time, these are roll-ups. I mean, people start with a few, maybe 10, 20 seats, which will possibly roll up to thousands of seats. Um, do, do you see any difference in the way SaaS companies are doing their demonstrations and 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 uh, those sessions? including discovery today, vis-a-vis the original audience you wrote the book for and uh, the audience you are targeting now? So the answer is no and yes. <laughs> Do I see any differences? In, at one level, no, because people are still doing the same thing. They're moving their mouses, <laughs> talking yeah. and clicking, and talking in most cases about features and in the best cases, talking about benefits and what people act, right. what their, their prospects actually ask for. 
Um, whether or not this is on-prem software, whether or not it's SaaS, whether or not it's a toolkit, where there's no UI that the end user consumes, for example, directly from that software, uh, whether or not it's it's the opposite of that of tools like Tableau and Spotfire that are you know nothing but surface, if you will, to a degree, um, whether or not they're workflow or process oriented tools, uh, the principles remain the same. The third edition, to a certain degree, embraces um, the different delivery vehicles. And again, that's partly why some of the stories and the other uh, supporting materials in the book are there, is to help give people some guidance and some other examples to draw from. Um, but fundamentally, the way that, that people traditionally have been presenting SaaS software suffer traditional demos suffer exactly the same problems as the on-prem stuff. Now, there is a there is a difference, and maybe this is what you're alluding to, to product-led software, wherein in theory, the, the consumer should be able to use it without any help and without any kind of a demo, without a tutorial and so forth. The book is not written for product-led software tools because by definition, they shouldn't need to be demonstrated. <laughs> yeah. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I will have uh, a bit of questions after we, we actually travel through the book about what you see is the future of software demos. I mean, we would like to talk about automated demos, AI-driven demos, and so on. But we'll come to that later at the end of the discussion. So let's let's okay. dive into the book. For those who are hearing you for the first time on this podcast, I would encourage them to go back and listen to our discussion. I'll share the link of, of the second edition that we did a few years back. But in a nutshell, I think a good place to start would be why demos fail. <laughs> Perfect topic. Um, what do you think is the number one reason why demos fail? My take is that we are too eager to show what we have to show, and we don't really care about what that means to you. You have nailed it on the head. We are victims of momentum. We have been taught to present as many features and functions in the allotted time as possible. Yeah. And in fact, one of the yeah. one of the little mini stories I think I relate in the book is how many times have we as presenters said the words, please stop me if you have any questions. I want this to be interactive. But what we're really thinking in our brains is please don't stop me and have questions, because if you do, I won't be able to go through all the stuff that I want to show you. Yeah. So the fundamental problem is insufficient discovery. It's presenting demos too early. Prospect says, just give me an overview. And what happened this is a traditional approach. What happens next is the vendor schedules a one hour overview demo. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and it's way too much. You know, the prospect could be in an active buying process. The bot prospect could, could be just browsing. But in either case, it's typically way too much. And if you're talking and mousing for an hour and you've not done any significant discovery, it's like walking into a restaurant and having a waiter never give you a mem menu, but just start bringing plate after plate after dish after dish of food in front of you and saying, hey, how does this look? Well, what about this? How about this? How about this other thing? <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a, pardon the pun, a recipe for failure. So yeah, that's the number one reason is insufficient discovery, typically by driven the drive to do a demo too early in the sales and buying process. By the way, that's heavily addressed in the third edition with a chapter on vision generation demos, which is, I love to describe as the crisp cure for stunningly awful harbor tour demos. <laughs> so the yeah. vision generation demos are designed to satisfy both parties. So the prospect's desire is to get a high level sense of what's possible, but without going too deep. I just want to get a sense of, is this in my wheelhouse? Is this, yeah. is this something I should investigate? Is this something I want to pursue? The vendor's objective should be to satisfy that desire crisply and then to move the conversation into discovery. That's what vision generation demos teach how to do. And that I think is one of the crucial chapters of the book. And it was heavily redeveloped. It was just a, it was a subtopic in the second edition. And it's been, um, 
heavily improved and much more, uh, much more richly documented uh, with the stories and the exercises in this third edition. It's, it's very strange that you said this because that was my next question. Uh, <laughs> literally, literally. I mean, let's talk about uh, vision generation demos. How are they different? I mean, that was my question. Uh, but I, I'd really like you to go in because I, I have part of that chapter I read and I, I completely agree, uh, including the experience you had calling the vendors and asking for a demo and them trying to qualify you. I mean, that's, that's, I, I somehow can't wrap my head around that idea of being, being able to ask a prospect questions, which allows me to qualify him, me as a salesperson. Without well, giving that, anything to him. That's, you know, that there's a whole cadre of people whose job is jobs are specifically to do that. They are the SDRs and BDRs. Their jobs yes. are are to protect <laughs> the sale, the vendor salesperson's time from unqualified leads. And um, yeah, what you just described is it's it has become a traditional process. And it's only the only benefit is for the vendor. Uh, and even the vendors don't realize how. In many cases, it's hurting them. I drafted an article a year or so ago called The Whores of Lead Churn, mm. because what I recognized um, is that there are many, many folks out there who are in a, if you will, just browsing context, meaning I'm not in an active buying process. I'm just trying to yeah. get a sense of, you know, what's going on in the future? This is something I should pursue. I just want to, I just want to, I just want to see what's possible. And the traditional qualification process to get a demo often includes things like BANT or similar uh, qualification methodologies, yeah. which basically rule those just browsing prospects out. And that, that's a win in their minds because they're, ah, we've not, uh, we're not going to waste any sales or pre-sales time doing an overview demo because this person's not in an active buying process. But here's the horror of lead churn. This person says, oh, great. I wanted to get a demo. I got nothing. <laughs> I got yeah. qualified out. So that person, when they do enter an active buying process, what's the likelihood yeah. that they would come back to that vendor? Very low. They'll go to Absolutely. someone else. Absolutely. So, so the one of the concepts behind vision generation that's uh, delineated in the book is to recognize that you may have those two constituencies and how to embrace them to satisfy the just browsers and encourage them to come back to you preferentially because you did invest in uh, addressing what they were interested in, plus a little bit more, uh, as well as the active buying process. People who are very early in their you know their understanding process. So, yeah, that's that's a huge <laughs> that's a huge piece of the uh, of the, the puzzle. And and also that the fact is, uh, Peter, as you know, I mean, we are really converting very few. I, I'm, I'm talking to people, just day before yesterday, I was talking to an uh, IT services company. Uh, they're telling me for every 500 leads they reach out to, they are able to establish connection with 50. Mm. They're able to have meeting with three. And out of every 20 to 30, they convert one. So, so just imagine what's going on there, right? So, so if they were, if they were actually paying attention to the browser, the browser was going to be most likely coming into the market. Nobody, nobody is like, it's not watching a movie that I'll go and watch a movie. I mean, nobody's browsing for the heck of browsing. They have right. some context, something is going on, uh, and. 50 60 percent of them will be back in the market and then we'll go after them at the point of decision when they have qualified us out already because we qualified them out six months back right exactly exactly that exactly that so that's a very <laughs> sad uh sad. i mean we are not learning uh, unfortunately i mean these numbers are, are are just going from bad to worse but but let's hold that let me come back to the vision demo and i would really like you to deep dive because i think that's one of the biggest uh, uh, takeaways from this book, because if they if they understand, uh, I'm not saying the only. I'm saying it's one of the biggest takeaways from this book. Because unless you understand what you are doing and the damage that you are causing to your market and and your potential customers, uh, you will and, and how you can by using the vision demo, you can turn it around completely. Uh, uh, I would like you to just dwell a bit on that. 
So let's set it up by uh, first describing what happens in a traditional overview demo, which is, which is really just living in the land of hope. Most traditional overview demos, this will, by the way, will lead in nicely to your, your, our discussion about automated demos, have a salesperson and a pre-salesperson. Salesperson is on the call. Pre-salesperson is driving the demo, uh, moving the mouse. They're 30 minutes to an hour. And they are, um, and they are typical overview demos, which means I know nothing or very, very little about my prospects. So I'm going to do what I have always done before. I'm going to show you a linear process. I'm going to show you how to set things up. I'm going to show you my workflows. And then if we don't run out of time, I'm going to show you some of the, uh, you know, the end results, if you will. So they basically violate every principle of business communication that one might ever find. I'm going to tell you way too much and none of it's going to be relevant <laughs> until we run out of time. Um, vision generation demo process starts off by saying, hey, dear prospect, you asked for a demo. Um, before I dive into anything too deep, let me share with you how our software has helped other similar job titles that might be in similar situations where you find yourself today. So right from the beginning, what we're trying to do is to establish a real connection with a prospect. So we review then, hey, you told me you're ahead of sales, you're at risk of not making your numbers, you said that you have challenges potentially with some of these various things. You know, there's a bunch of other folks we've worked with that had those types of challenges. They said they were looking for this, this, and these capabilities. We provided those capabilities. And what they report now using our tools is they've been able to enjoy the following kind of tangible results. And then here's the important thing. You then ask, how does that compare with your situation? So now, taking sideways for a moment, I haven't shown any software. All I've done is established what is called an informal success story, a reference story, and invited the prospect to contrast and compare that versus their situation. So right away, we're bringing the prospect into this as a conversation. So it's not an hour of, I'm going to talk, and hopefully you'll, you'll find something that looks interesting. I'm already asking you to comment on how does this compare? And they say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm at risk of making my numbers, although I look pretty good. Um, the problems you described, they're similar, but I, it's a little different. I'm suffering from this, and I have these two other things. The capabilities you described to these other folks, they're also similar. Yeah, well, that looks really interesting, and that sounds really interesting, but what I also need is this. And now we are already in a brief discovery conversation. So we're already increasing mutually. <laughs> Yeah. our probability of success for this meeting. So the next step is you go through a little bit of that discovery, and then you remember that your prospect wants to see something. And the, the trick here is to jump to the end of a traditional demo based on what you've learned and present the deliverables that are relevant for that job title. So for example, if I was talking to a head of sales and they say, I don't have, I have insufficient visibility into uh, the solidity of deals each quarter. And I find it very, very hard to coach my reps because I don't, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you would show a dashboard of the major projects, uh, their closed probability percent, uh, who the reps are. And then you probably show a second dashboard of each reps with respect to their, uh, their various stages, where are they strong, where are they weak, where they need more, where they need less. And the voiceover is, what you're looking at here are the end deliverables that other folks have been using similarly to solve these kinds of problems. What do you think? How do these compare with what you have in mind? So I love to use dining analogies. Uh, and in a traditional demo, what the salesperson, what the sales team is doing is they're, they're taking uh, the prospect that just entered a restaurant and they're taking them into the kitchen to go through the whole process of washing vegetables and prepping meat and fish and then chopping them and preparing sauces. They're showing all the details of these things. And then, and then guess what? They run out of time before they actually plate the dish and serve it. <laughs> yeah. So what we're saying is instead of showing them all the, the chopping and cooking methods, you show them the plated dish or dishes 
and you say, is this the kind of thing you have in mind? Because if it is, then we can set a time to go into this in as much detail as you want. But, and here's a very important point, if it's not what you have in mind, if this is, if we're off base, if it's not in alignment, then neither of us is going to waste our time and we can make a mutual decision where to go from there. So does that, does that all help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is the thing that if the customer, if we can, and I think that's the core of any initial stage in sales, right? Can you, can you give enough confidence to your prospect that he's going to share information with you? And, yeah, so this is and, a, this is a this is a quid pro quo process. So, prospect absolutely. asks for a demo. We say, "Great, I'm going to give you a demo. I'm also going to ask you for th- a few things in return." And that's that's the nature of this, and it becomes a conversation. I'm such a delight. Absolutely, absolutely. It's time for a short break. Stay with us. After the break, let's say that you were evaluating. You are a prospect, and you're evaluating. Uh, bringing in a new CRM system, and you know you've you know there are many many out there. Uh, you've got eleven or thirteen different stakeholders within your organization, from the head of sales to individual sales people, head of pre-sales to individual pre-sales people, enablement, marketing, you know, sales operations. So you've got all these different disciplines, all of whom have different needs, desires, expectations, and deliverables that they want and need out of the software. Traditional demos, um, when they try to to embrace this large group of of people, are bound to fail (laughs) Um, because because they end up trying to to present a long um, spaghetti bowl of demo, <laughs> uh, where they you know they bring everybody into the room at one time and they have them there for four hours or six hours or eight hours. I've been in these, by the way, um, and they they just they they jump from topic to topic to topic, trying to embrace the needs of the the whole population. You are listening to a business podcast network original. Podcasting is the fastest growing content marketing opportunity, which is untapped. We can help you craft your audio strategy and help leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that the smartphone penetration provides. It is easy, it is powerful and personal. Talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to your targets like never before. Write to us at bpn at bizcast.in that is bpn at biz. C A S T dot I N Business Podcast Network Podcasts End to End. Welcome back. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host for Bits About Books and founder of Pitchlink, the buyer seller engagement platform. Let's dive right back into the episode where we left it. I, I want you to talk about the multiplayer demos and organizing the features in, in order of the ranks of the people who are attending that. Uh, I, I just want to understand the dynamics that you have in mind when you are talking of it. Is it something where there is a group of people who have agreed to meet and we have not done enough discovery or is it post-discovery this comes in? And if it is either, how do we tackle that? So it is it is both. Um, but the chapter on uh, complex demos, multi-solution, uh, multiplayer demos, yeah. Uh, yeah. presupposes that sufficient discovery has been done for each group. There's, okay. you know, again, you could go back and say, okay, let's do a vision generation demo and and then follow it with a technical proof demo based on what we learned. But the the way the chapter is laid out and, and the process is expected to be followed is is our situation where you have let let's say that you were evaluating, you are a prospect and you're evaluating. Uh, bringing in a new CRM system, and you know you've you know there are many many out there. Uh, you've got eleven or thirteen different stakeholders within your organization, from the head yeah. of sales to individual sales people, head of pre sales to individual pre sales people, enablement, marketing, you know, sales operations. So you've got all these different disciplines, all of whom have different needs, desires, expectations, and deliverables that they want and need out of the software. Traditional demos, um, when they try to to embrace this large group of of people, are bound to fail. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Because... 
because they end up trying to trying to present a long um, spaghetti bowl of demo <laughs> uh, where they you know they bring everybody into the room at one time and they have them there for four hours or six hours or eight hours. I've been in these, by the way, um, mm. and they. It just they they jump from topic to topic to topic, trying to embrace the needs of the the whole population, and the end result is the prospects say it looks too confusing, it was complicated. Uh, high ranking players leave after forty minutes because they they're down in the weeds and they're not seeing anything of interest to them. So the chapter basically says you need to you need to cut and slice and dice your audience and what you're delivering so that you align to the individual job titles, their workflows, their processes. Um, and you put together an agenda that reflects that. So there are software companies that will do full day and even two or three day demos. You you will encounter these. Um, and they need to be deeply, you know, they need to be well organized. Uh, a couple of basic principles just to help with this. Number one, Rank has its privileges. You need to uh, engage and satisfy the needs of the highest ranking people uh, in any demo meeting from your prospect first. <laughs> because if they're not on board, you are you and everyone else are all wasting your time. <laughs> yeah. um, they have to say, you know, the, remember the old pyramid of, of yes, 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 next layer up, yes, 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 yes. And you get to the top and the top says no. <laughs> so... Um, yeah. You need to have the top aligned. Um, you dress accordingly. You address people by in order of, let's say, rank or job title from the most important, the senior, down to the, with all due respect, the least important, the staffers and the admins. Um, and then you need to slice and dice by uh, department or job title. So, for example, let's get sales together for our CRM demo um, first, and let's address uh, heads of sales or head of revenues desires for reporting and uh, analysis and what if analysis, for example, first. Let's then, and when they're satisfied and they're nodding their heads, then let's go on to sales managers who have similar but slightly different reporting and engagement and workflow needs. And then finally, let's map to the salespeople themselves who really want to see the fastest way to get what they need to get done in the tool, you know, executed, and hopefully there's value back to them in terms of prompts and alerts and so forth. That's the mindset. We slice it up. So an analogy going back to a, a restaurant, imagine if a restaurant uh, brought you um, <laughs> four days worth of food all at once. How would you feel? I just surrounded you on the table with four days of food. <laughs> How would you feel? I mean, you'll definitely not feel good. Uh, yeah, confused, over, over, confused, overwhelmed. Uh, yeah, overwhelmed. Confused, yes. overwhelmed. Yeah. I don't know where yeah. to start. This stuff's getting yeah. cold. Ooh, that doesn't even look good anymore. So it's the same concept. You know, you've got four days worth of food. We need to organize it in accord with um, what this person wants to eat or how hungry are they? What are they interested in? What is this person at the table interested in? Um, oh, well, what are their allergies or what are their likes? What are this, their dislikes? So that's a little bit of an analogy we can use on slicing and dicing a demo the same way. So that's, that's a new chapter. Um, and it was developed rather richly. The multiplayer, multi-solution demos is developed and specified rather richly because that's an area that um, when I drafted the second edition, I made the inaccurate assumption that people would simply, you know, apply that sort of in practice going forward in those slices and dices. Hmm. So how's that? Yeah, absolutely makes sense. And I think I think it's it's a complex. Uh, first of all, imagine the amount of effort that goes into getting those thirteen people in the same room at the same time, right? Absolutely. Uh, and and if you if you if you mess that up, you're not going to repeat that again. That that's that's your one shot. And I think it's so important to pay attention to what you just said and how to drive it through the hierarchy and and ensuring that you have clarity of at least some portion of what each of these layers are looking for. Otherwise, I mean, you can do a demo for an hour or two or three or whatever. Uh, nothing is going to move beyond that. Uh, so uh, absolutely. Two, two more quick uh, uh, things I want to touch upon. Uh, one is virtual demos. So how 
do they differ from in person demos and especially because in today's day and age i think i, I don't know whether you have any statistics whether there is any competitive data as to how much of virtual demonstration is going on and how much is actually in person would you have any number it well i ask every single prospect that same question what you know what's your what's your current practice and what do you what do you feel your practice is going to be going forward as you know how do you how do you want to strategically address engagements with your customers in terms of face to face hybrid or or totally virtual um but the but this is i mean this is part and parcel now part of doing demos uh yeah. 20 years ago we talked about you know you could use webex and blah 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 and it became more and more and more important with the advent of course of covid we went 100% yeah now organizations are making decisions uh strategically do we want to uh try to outflank competition and actually show up on site with our prospects uh are our prospects going to accept that yeah. um this chapter lays out um best practices from a couple of different perspectives one is it says well what would we do if we were face to face and how can we mimic that or model that when we're over the web so you know for example when you're face to face uh you can actually walk right up to somebody in a demo and and hand them a prop or a visual aid mm -hmm. or a sheet of paper or whatsoever um yeah. so there are ways to physically engage um how do you model that when you're over the web um these are the yeah. fun things so that, so you don't end up yeah. in a situation where you say um can you see my screen <laughs> and then it's talk and click and talk and click uh yeah. interspersed every 10 minutes with any question so far um yeah. the hybrid i do want to identify one thing that i lay out in the book uh probably in too much detail but i think it's important hybrid meetings so thinking in terms of this Traditionally we used to do 100% face to face generally or 100% virtual. But now, you know, it's quite likely that you could you could fly to a customer site or travel to a customer site and there's four people there in the room with you, but there's also four people connecting over the web. Um you could do demos at your site that it might have uh some of your team face to face some of your team virtual some of your prospects team face to face some of your prospects team virtual. So understanding even these scenarios uh and what you might need to do to prepare for them and then more importantly to execute in those those situ situations i think is going to become more and more important and that's why i laid these out in in this chapter in the book right and and the the, the last one that i'll touch upon is is storytelling ah how does that dovetail into this whole demo culture if you say I mean how do you integrate yeah. that? So the first aspect of, of this is really understanding what a good story is and how they can or should be used. And stories support points you you're trying to make in your demo. Um and that's the way I've, I've drafted the book is to use stories exactly that same way. Now to go sort of traditional for a moment, how many times do have you ever heard somebody uh some some manager say to their team, "Hey, wrap a story around your demo." How many times you ever heard that phrase? <laughs> I, so, I I I I don't think I ever heard that, honestly. Oh, you've never heard that. Okay. So our, yeah. the, so the the population out there will all be nodding their heads saying, "Yeah, I hear it all the time. Wrap a story around your demo. You got to make you got to include storytelling." Well, yeah. wrapping a story around your demo generally means putting some kind of structure to a narrative, but that doesn't necessarily yeah. make it engaging or memorable. Stories um good stories uh have elements and this is what I develop in the book elements in them that make them particularly memorable and able to retain the key elements of information so you know when you think about a a feature or a function it's it's a very weak entity on your its own but if you wrap the use of that feature or function in a story that has uh certain story, st successful storytelling elements then that that idea can live forever and one of the examples i use is in the book is are you familiar with the well i'll give you the punchline um slow and steady wins the race so <laughs> what's that what's yeah. that story what's what's that story and who who uh, captured it first slow and steady wins the race well uh, it was the hare and the tortoise story right yeah it's the tortoise and the hare and when was that yeah. first captured uh 
I, I possibly don't know. Uh, it's it's one of Aesop's fables. Oh yes, Aesop's, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And he lived Aesop's six, fables, yeah. Yeah, 600 BC or BCE as we say today. 600 so 2600 years ago. Now here's here's the clever thing. The moral of that story is my child, if you simply persevere and work hard, you will do well. Okay? Try telling any teenager in the universe that little homily, that phrase. If you just work hard, you're going to do well. What the typical response from your child or teenager is, yeah, right. <laughs> Gone. Yeah. However, when you, you take that meme, that thought, and you wrap it inside a story that has certain successful storytelling elements, uh, it's relevant, it's got an element of surprise, it's got a few others. And, and by the way, the, the, book, the beautiful book, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, is where I drew these storytelling uh, uh, structures and elements, and is what really defines a great story. So when you think of, when people today think about uh, uh, slow and steady wins the race. They often start thinking about the Warner Brothers Bugs Bunny cartoon. Um, mm-hmm. It has comedy, and if you look closely, you'll see that the, the turtle, for example, the t- uh, cheating at the beginning of the race. Um, mm-hmm. But it's made memorable, and there and this story is in every single culture around the world today. Every single culture. Yeah. Intriguingly, the animals change from yeah. culture. Culture. Um, but the story remains the same. So now, why am I using this as an example? Because features in software are frankly boring. But if you wrap that feature and how it was used in a story that resonates with your prospect, their likelihood that they will remember that is magnitudes higher. And their ability to retell that story with high fidelity on how that feature was used um, goes up markedly. In workshops, um, and this is in the book, in the workshops, we often use a story uh, that effectively goes, you're riding a bicycle rather fast, you skid on some gravel, you fall, you hurt, your bike's okay, um, you're bleeding, and somebody comes up to you and starts offering you uh, books, a patch kit for your bike. They offer music, records, all these various things that are not useful at all. Because what you need uh, are a few aspirin to take away the pain, and some bandages to stop the bleeding. And I'll, I'll tell this story uh, at the beginning of a workshop. And then at the end of the workshop, I'll ask, and it's a day and a half later, I'll ask, uh, hey, how many of you can, can repeat that story that I, I told a day and a half ago? And, he, and near, I would say 80% plus of the audience can repeat that story with 80% accuracy a day and a half later. That's the power of stories. So that's what we teach people how to do in the book for software demonstrations. Awesome. I think uh, I think people. Uh, I'm definitely going back to the book now. Now that I am not tasked with asking questions. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I I I no whatever I scheme. I mean I I'm I learned a lot from this. Literally, Peter, we we flipped our own demos uh, after I spoke to you first time. Uh, how did, so we how did showed, it work? Uh, it's it's working very well. Uh, I mean, we we started we start by showing what the customers customer will see in my product, and and what they are delivering actually, and then we get into the as you said how the dish is prepared business because that's really I mean if you if you if you like the outcome, this is table stakes. You will learn it anyway. It doesn't really matter how you do it as long as it's exactly. doing it right. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. So, so so yeah so i i think uh, this is this is a lot of uh, uh, your i mean i learned a lot from doing discovery and not going to that discussion because it can it can really be a long one and i i would, I would like to do that <laughs> some other time but uh, i think i see the alignment and i see the value and i think it's uh, it's incredibly important that every team in sales read these two books now i think it, it's 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 that's that critical uh, my my only uh, reservation is most people will not put it to practice. Uh, that's my my only reservation, and 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 it's it's their loss, honestly. Uh, this is. Um, I made a note when I was preparing for our our, our call today that um, you know the the technology adoption curve applies to vendors as much as it does to our prospects. 
prospects. And yeah, you know, 16% of the population <clears throat> will take a look at this book, consume it and go, oh, yes, I love this. And they're going to put it into practice right away. 34% are going to say, well, it resonates, but I want to see that it, it succeeds with someone else before I make a change. So that's the early majority. And then the next 34% are going to continue doing what they're doing today and then grudgingly eventually adopt it because everybody else in the world is doing it. Well, it's not even that much, but they'll, it'll, they're, a, they're a late majority player. And of course, the laggards will never, ever, 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 ever change. So I totally agree with you. And I, I'll, I'll offer um, the 16% of you that choose to adopt and apply this methodology. This becomes a sustainable competitive advantage just yeah. in the way you are executing discovery and doing demos. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Before you go, I have these two questions. Uh, what are your thoughts about automated demos? Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of softwares getting built and, and some of them are really good uh, yes. in terms of what they promise and what they deliver. So it's not that there's a, but where do you see them fitting in actually? And where do you see that going? So. I love automated demo technology. Um, it, is, it is a rescue for people that suffer from 30% or more wasted demos, meaning demos that are delivered with insufficient discovery, demos that are the demos that basically are done the same way over and over, but with a live person. <laughs> and I've done this when I was went back doing demos, um, I still am. Um, I would do this, you know, and I would pride on, yeah, I can deliver this thing over and over and over and over and make it sound sweet and wonderful, but that's such a waste. If you're repeating yourself, yeah. it is by definition. So there's a pile of different tools out there. I, and I did not include a chapter in the book on uh, automated demos because the technology is evolving very, very rapidly. True. Um, I'm right now drafting and near completing drafting an article that really is designed to be an ancillary chapter that can be evolved over time that um, talks about you know, how to use automated demo technology and, and the approaches for putting together these actual automated demos. Uh, so uh, I would say they fall into two categories. Uh, the first are tools like Consensus Today that offer a, a menu-based approach, and I love what they're doing. Uh, many approaches described in the book. Um, and the second are those that, if you will, stitch together um, demo components um, and enable call outs and explanations and so forth to take place. Um, I think that latter set are more difficult to put together and deliver because they tend to be just an automated rephrasing of a traditional overview demo. So my general guidelines would be to uh, look at vision generation demos as the template to follow for most of these automated demos uh, for particularly the, the, let's say, the early meetings. There are also the use of, if you will, automated technical proof demos, where it's just as easier to record a segment, send it to your prospect and say, here's, here's the capability you look for. We don't have to set up a, a time for me to do it live. Just take a listen and look and let us know if we've, we've mapped to it. Um, automated demo technology is a fabulous rescue to reduce the number of wasted demos to push, if you will, the discovery process in an automated fashion as well to your prospect in an asynchronous mode. I love the technology. Wonderful. Bits About Books is brought to you by Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Pitchlink makes buying easy by enabling high-quality engagement between buyers and sellers through its presentation and discussion modules. Sellers create customized sales narratives using sales collaterals and personal videos and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive buyer-qualified engagement. Pitchlink requires no installation or download and holds the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversations. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without intuition. Call us on 99021-631-32. There's a lot of chatter about AI since chat GPT last six months. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, and you see some, some very interesting tools like Mid Journey, uh, a lot of diverse applications coming out uh, using AI. Uh, do you see that 
it would be possible uh, that you eliminate the person altogether and the AI can do exactly what you are asking a human to do? Um, that is such a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I would say eventually, yes. Absolutely, yes. Um, however, I think that point in time is quite far off. <laughs> um, yeah. Right now, the AI technology is really, really good at taking a look at what has been done and summarizing it. So, yeah. you know, in that context, and, and in providing prompts based on what's being heard in conversations related. Um, but today, you know, um, I, I was trying to find a good analogy for this. What AI cannot yet yet do is invent something new. And that, I think, is the, the critical difference uh, between somebody who's live and somebody who is or something, that, if you will, that is a pure AI engine. Um, now, I also think that will probably inevitably change. But today, if you ask, you know, if you ask Siri, uh, tell me a story, um, she won't know how to do it. <laughs> And yeah, she will have no idea I mean, how to craft a story for, for you and your interests. Tell me a bedtime story. Right. Tell me a children's story, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, because it knows context. You have to provide way too much information. The same is true of demos. You can't simply say, hey, AI, generate a demo for X without providing the, the logical input, which means somebody or something had to execute discovery, for example. I could easily see a day, though, where you have an AI buyer <laughs> talking to an AI seller um, could be a very, very efficient, very rapid conversation. We get, we're just pulled entirely out of the scenario. We're just the beneficiaries. <laughs> yeah, so, that? And, and that, uh, absolutely. And, and I, I believe that that will happen very quickly for commoditized stuff. I mean, if an organization is buying, say, to, say I don't know, 5,000 toilet paper rolls, and it's talking to 20 vendors trying to get the best price, uh, that would shift to AI faster than we think it would. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's already, that's already in place now with predictive analytics to say, Hey, you know, you, right. you know, based on the numbers we've seen in the past and your, you know, your the parameters you've provided us, you know, here's our recommendation for your toilet paper use over the next six months. Yeah. That's already, yeah. that's already in place today. Um, but the ability to, yeah, the ability to pivot in a conversation based on something, uh, that may yeah. still be a human thing, at least for the near future. Yeah, I I, I would agree, but uh, I, I, but but I think we are we are going to get very close. Uh, so wherever you do not need human intervention, and whatever can be taken out of all the knowledge that organization has, for instance, I'm selling X product, and I have these hundreds of thousands of customer interactions which is already in some form captured, the AI will be able to take it to a very, very long distance because most of the time it will be the same questions similar customers are going to come up with. Uh, and only the variance which it can't handle will then get pushed to a human, which will, which will then be uh, possibly taken up. I mean, this is, I'm, 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 I'm thinking ahead. <laughs> Well, this is, I mean, this is, uh, this is the way many, many processes are operating today. The, the, you know, workflow automation is designed to execute workflows. And what do we as humans receive? We alert, we receive alerts, uh, triggers when yeah. something is out of the ordinary, exceptional, it's an opportunity, exception whatsoever, but it's not normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the challenge for today is understanding what questions to ask. Uh, you yeah. know, the prompts, the ability to form prompts that give meaningful results. Um, delightfully, Henry Kissinger, years ago at a press conference said, so what questions do you have for my answers? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's kind of where we're going with AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but, but in another way, if you look at it, uh, Peter, that's pretty much what all the bad demo guys are doing to the prospects today. Well, that's, yeah, and, and this is a Jigo thing, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you have a, th a thousand traditional overdue demos and you're analyzing the prospects, you know, responses and results, um, what you're going to be doing, and this is a really interesting point, this is a Deming point, you'll be tuning your process for awful demos. 
you'll be optimizing doing things poorly. Uh, Michael Johnson said, you can spend, I think it was something like, you could spend 12 hours shooting baskets every day. But if you are shooting baskets the wrong way, you're just going to spend 12 hours getting really good at being really bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. So there's two pieces of this. You're right. There's two pieces. One is how to ask the right questions. The other is your training set. I mean, AI is based on training sets. So if your training sets yeah. um, are traditional uh, data, then you're simply optimizing tradition. And that's yeah. not necessarily moving things forward. Great demo is designed to enable people to make a step change, not small yeah. incremental changes, but a large yeah. step change in their practices. I don't see AI currently, uh, let me rephrase, I don't see how we've been using AI currently to enable those kinds of, to uncover and pursue those kinds of step changes. Absolutely. Peter, delightful as always. Thank you so much for your time and patience. And I hope uh, you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. It's a delight. And I'm looking forward to another book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Me too. Me too. See you, sir. Have a wonderful day. Thanks very much. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes with great conversations on breakthrough books. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you do not miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being with us today on Bits About Books, where we talk to authors about breakthrough books on sales, marketing, and business. We hope this conversation helped inform and motivate as we all navigate a rapidly changing business environment. For us, these are enlightening conversations enriched with knowledge and expertise. We encourage you to go out and buy the book to learn firsthand and implement some of the great ideas we discussed today. We hope to have you with us again in the next exciting episode of Bits About Books. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast platforms like iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcast from and give us a rating while you are at it. This BizCast original podcast is produced for PitchLink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform, where the mission is to make buying easy. Hosted by Subhanjan Sarkar and produced by Rajiv Aditya. See you next time and have a wonderful day.